Today, we are speaking with Christy Pambianki, who is the Executive Vice President and CHRO of Verizon, where she is responsible for over 135,000 employees. Prior to joining Verizon last year, Christy was the Executive Vice President of People and Digital at Corning. Christy serves as a director of the board of the Verizon Foundation. She is a member of the Dean's Advisory Council for the School of Industrial and Labor Relations at Cornell University, where she earned her undergraduate degree. She serves as a board member for the Center for Advanced Human Resource Studies and also the Lumina Foundation. Christy was inducted as a fellow to the National Academy of Human Resources, recognizing her career contributions to the field of HR. Christy, we are excited to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. I think there's so much to share and talk about and learn uh, on this subject as we're all evolving real time. So I'm, I'm just happy to be included and excited to share what we've learned so far at Verizon. And so thank you. So this pandemic uh, has completely reshaped the way we live, the way we work. Many organizations have moved to a fully distributed model but not every organization has had that luxury. Uh, so for an essential service provider like Verizon, it must have been very challenging to keep all your employees safe while making sure that Verizon community is well connected. So can you walk us through your experience in the last six months, how you've been able to transform 100,000 employees to work remotely? The... Um pandemic has been so challenging on so many levels. And when the year started very early in the year, we had the first um, indication that there was the potential for a pandemic starting when we got news out of Wuhan of the coronavirus and the unexpected toll it was taking there. So we mobilized our Asia response team to begin to put a plan around crisis support for our employees in Asia. Um, and I had experience over the last 20 years with a number of pandemics or diseases that have emerged that businesses had to prepare and respond to. So with some familiarity, I was kind of keeping a close eye on this. Our team was doing a great job. And when it moved to Europe, my concern and alarm level went up that it was likely going to come uh, to North America and then eventually into the Southern Hemisphere um, because of the nature of the transmission being so uh, readily and potentially airborne. And so by the first or second weeks of March, we had already been meeting since late January, we started kind of confronting the reality that this was likely going to turn into a pandemic. And it all kind of happened very quickly in that first 10 days of March, where we moved from some travel bans to states taking action and closing down school systems and putting in shelter in place orders. And so we began a dialogue around the 10th of March saying, we're gonna have to figure out how to work from home. And as a leadership team at Verizon, we were a little bit stunned by that challenge because we believed we had something on the order of 90,000 of our 135,000 employees in what we consider frontline roles that we didn't envision could be something done from home or in a remote setting, uh, whether that be our employees in the retail stores, our field technicians and engineers that are out building the network, servicing the network, servicing customers on premise in their homes and their small businesses and their corporate businesses. And we also have a large group of our employees that do customer care in call and care centers that have telephony and other services centralized. So we were a little bit paralyzed by that daunting uh, reality. And so as a few days went by, it was sort of the settling in and that's what happens in a crisis that you are not in control and you actually have to find a way to confront that reality if you're gonna be able to continue to conduct business. And we felt a very, very high bar because it wasn't just business. People in the crisis are relying on their connectivity. They need to be able to work from home, do school from home, be in contact with family members, relatives, et cetera, that may be unwell. So their ability to use their um, connections and things were really paramount. So with that reality, we sort of told all of our employees the 12th and the 13th of March, which was a Thursday and Friday, that we were going to be working on a way to pivot everybody to work from home and that each team would start talking to their team about it. And by the following week, we had pivoted 100 
and 15,000 employees to a home-based uh, work construct. So, and, and the thing I would say was so interesting about it is it was through the engagement with our employees that we said, this is in principle, what we're going to try to do. And we're going to have to all kind of work together on it. And there was a lot of innovation that happened along the way. And I would say we accomplished things we didn't know was possible. Um, a few examples of that is, uh, for example, we have large call centers and the, the equipment is on site. And so we wound up the following week having pickup days and employees were given a time to come to like a drive-through line and our facility and our leadership team actually came in. All of the assets were clean, so to speak, and washed. So they were, you know, sanitary with all of the coronavirus, um, you know, material and guidance from the CDC. And it was like packaged and it would be uh, set up to say, oh, Christy Pambianchi. And it was just like put in my car and I could drive away and go home and set up at my home workstation. Um, similarly, so that was one, I thought, just amazing, you know, capability and innovation that a lot of our team leaders came up with. And that, you know, was on the order of 20,000 plus people. We also had with governors uh, putting in place shelter and or, um, place orders and shutting retail locations and businesses other than essential businesses. We looked at our entire retail store footprint and said, OK, we um, have to remain open. Some doors have to remain open for access for emergency services. So we had about 30% of the store doors open with a radius and a drive time that we thought, okay, this is providing enough coverage for people to have emergency access, but living within the spirit of the government's request for shelter in place. So that left um, you know, over 10,000, you know, on the order of 14,000 of our retail employees without a go-to job location and a job to do. So we made the decision to um, pivot them to telesales and customer care from home. And we sent equipment to their house and we did really rapid cycle training because these were jobs they were not trained for. And so, and the training that the learning organization had developed was for in-person training or at the call center being trained by a coworker or in you know, the training room at that facility where a new job incumbent may go for their first five or six weeks on the job. So we literally were on every Monday, like, okay, we're training 10,000 hours of this module this week. So we sent assets home, we did training. And we also made some testimonial videos so we could share out with the whole rest of, we called the V team, so we could share out with them you know, an employee telling a story like, hey, I didn't really, this isn't what I do every day, but I also want to be part of the team. I want to be helping support our customers. And they, you know, might adon their headset and talk about some of their telesales. And, you know, they also might be confronting elder care or child care issues in the home that this allows. So it was like such an amazing pivot where we pivoted the centers to be from home or we pivoted our retail employees to do other jobs. And then I would say the final example is we have a huge field force. You know, we have technicians, they have uh, trucks, the trucks are outfitted with parts and network assets. They have orders that they're doing every day, maybe to come in to repair something in a home or a business, maybe to continue building up the network, pre do preventative maintenance on a central office. And again, with the shelter in place orders, um, couldn't really enter the home. Uh, we also, for keeping our employees safe, we made the decision that we would only be taking orders and uh, dispatch calls for uh, critical services. So if, you know, I happen to call up and say, hey, I'm, I'm uh, at home now because of COVID, I'd like to put new boxes and new services in all the rooms in my house, and I'd like a fourth, you know, video. So we, we felt like that wasn't in the spirit of essential service and connectivity. And, it, you know, we love our customers but we also wanted to make sure we were keeping them and our employees safe. So we um, were, had clear guidance around what kind of calls we would do. Um, but we did two things that were really innovative with the employees' help. We came up with something called home garaging. So normally our technicians come in every day. They, um, you know, it's like a little bit of a dispatch protocol where they understand like, here's your tickets for the day. It's, it's obviously a little bit digital now, not a, like an actual sheet and a clipboard, but you kind of get the, the, the drift. And, you know, they're with their colleagues, they're filling their truck with whatever they need, and then they're off. And then they come back in at the end of the day to check in, and then they drive their own vehicle home. 
we came up with the concept of home garaging. So they could come in, get uh, equipment and then be remote and based out of their own driveway or their home location, just get up, get in their truck and then go to their dispatches for the day. And so that kept, uh, that reduced the number of employees that were congregating and coming together at the central log, the garage locations, um, which we felt improved their safety and the health of our employees. And then they could, we could continue servicing from home. And the second innovation there was something called Texi. We created an app so the technician could go to the premise, deliver the equipment maybe to the front door of the, of the location. And then the customer could put the box in the premise and then they would both turn this app on and the technician could see what the stuff and then walk the customer through what to do when they had like kind of a touchless experience. And so those were just a couple of uh, three examples of how we pivoted which enabled us to get that many employees in a work from home, so to speak, or home garage and construct. Well, that, that, that's real innovation and uh, very impressive that you were able to, uh, you know, address such wide variety of challenges. How long did it take you f- from starting in March to actually getting all of this done? We were two weeks. So within two weeks, we had, by the end of, you know, we started that March, it was actually Friday the 13th. I wish I would forget that it was, but it was in March that 10th, uh, you know, that 10th through the 13th, when you started to see the state shutdowns, about six states by Thursday had shut down. And we were really aggressive about, we need solutions to deal with this, Um, not only to get our employees pivoted to remote working constructs, but also we needed, um, protocols for dealing with cases, underlying conditions, caregiver leave. So we invented a whole new set of uh, HR and leave policies to support it. And so two weeks by the end of March. And the other thing, you know, we had some guiding principles that we felt really helped us. And I think that's one of the things in a crisis, you have no control. And there's a lot written about change management and you know um, how people deal with accepting change. It's a little bit like that in a crisis. And so as I'm helping the leadership team accept the reality of the situation we were in, at any given time, you know, the 11, 10, 11, some odd of us on the, on the CEO's team are in a different point of the acceptance curve for like what kind of challenge we're facing, how long we're facing that challenge, what you know, degrees of freedom we have or the idea that we're actually not in control. And so now as a leader, all you could do is be have guiding principles and that prepare you to respond and try to get pro- proactive about the things that might be coming at you. And in most crisis response training, the first thing that the experts will have you do is begin to sort of capture what are the facts, what are the things that we are assuming, and what are continued unknowns. And so that you're always mindful of the difference between a fact and an assumption and something unknown. So as I was leading the team through that, I'm like, these are the facts. These are the assumptions and the unknowns. And as things move from assumption and unknown into the fact column, we we can revise our response to say, is it still addressing that new reality where we have new facts? So that's um, something that helped us. And as different leaders kind of got got through that curve, for example, when we had, um, you know, we just got we had built out playbooks for how we would handle cases. But when you start to really process contact tracing, 14 day quarantines, uh, clean and remediate the premise, bring employees back to the premise, most likely have another case, do that all over again. The reality of how disruptive that is and that you can't actually conduct business that way makes being able to work remotely and keeping people separated paramount. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, I think when people really look back on, you know, what happened here, if we had set a team out and said, hey, we would like to pivot 115,000 of Verizon's people to work from home, they probably would have built a two to three year implementation plan. Mm -hmm. And why were we able to do in two weeks something that otherwise might have taken multiple years? And I think it was because the, the, the absolute and complete crystal clarity of the need for change and a singular focus on that and then the clear you know, mandate, so to speak, of the health risk and the, you know, the government orders and things like that. And so from a human behavior perspective, you know, that's something I'm always interested in with my field of expertise. And I always say never underestimate the power of what, you know, large groups of people mobilized with the same purpose can actually accomplish. And I think this is a 
glowing example of that. This episode is brought to you by Experfy. Incubated in Harvard Innovation Lab, Experfy provides custom future of work solutions, such as private talent clouds and skill taxonomies. Experfy differentiates itself by using subject matter experts to pre-vet and pipeline candidates for AI and high-end technology skills. However, Experfy Talent Cloud Platform is skill agnostic and can be licensed to build custom talent clouds for any and all skills. In a different use case, enterprises interested in employee intermobility can license the Experfy platform to create an internal gigs marketplace where interested employees can be algorithmically matched to projects, gamifying their learning experience. Visit www.experfy.com for more information. So Verizon, as a large organization, has a strong union presence. So what role did you, the union play in uh, this response? Yeah, so we have a great partnership with the CWA and the IBEW are the two primary unions that we have uh, relationships with. Um, and they have a number of our employees organized, you know, and uh, there's terms and conditions of the work environment that we um, had to make agreements with the union on to go forward. They've been an amazing partner um, in this journey. In those first two weeks during that pivot, I think we had something on the order of nine negotiations and agreements, which is, again, like another record breaking level of speed and uh, leadership up and down the chain because they have locals that roll all the way up to their national, just like we have field locations that roll up to our um, CEO leadership table. And whether it's all the way from the president of the union down to the local uh, representatives, we had immense participation and we all wanted the same thing, which is the safety and the um, continued you know, employment and service of our customers and safety and health of our employees. And so we, um, we, you know, we think that that was another key ingredient to our success um, which is, you know, bringing the, the, the union right into the dialogue with us probably, you know, six, eight, 10 times a day. And we also did, um, you know, some really innovative things that, you know, when I, we look, when we started to see the schools close um, and during that first and second week of March, Congress was contemplating um, not only the stimulus, but stipulations about leaves. And so we already had developed an employer uh, leave policy that we think is very progressive. It's still, I think, way ahead of what I've seen other companies do. And so I said, okay, but it sounds like in the next 48 hours, Congress is going to issue something. Why don't we wait and make sure we're in line with that and that we you know, don't have to make a change so quickly? And so we were pretty surprised that the program that came out had a stipulation around leaves for, for people affected by COVID or with caregiver needs, but only applied to employers with less than 500 employees. So um, that really didn't offer much guidance for how an employer of our size should react. And so we, you know, in the land of, uh, you know, return to office, um, we kind of decided to take a page out of a construct we already had. Um, a lot of companies went the path of, why don't we just add time to PTO banks? But if you really think about prolonged school closures, prolonged limited or no access to daycare, you know, three, five, eight days, whatever you want to call it in a PTO bank isn't going to solve for that problem. So we chose to do something completely different. And we um, decided to look at the parallel that we had with something like short term disability and say, OK, we're going to create um, a caregiver leave policy. So we allowed employees to request caregiver leave if they were not able to uh, work, even in a remote setting. And we went to great lengths to say, it's okay if your toddler is sitting at the table next to you eating while you're trying to handle a customer call. Um, so we created a leave where people could request up to eight weeks off, full pay uh, and benefits. And then after the eight weeks, if they had continuing needs, they would drop down to 60% pay for up to a total of 26 weeks which again, if in the space of HR policy and program development is similar to a lot of the disability constructs. And um, obviously that's something we proactively went to the union with and told that we wanted to implement and we wanted to implement it for all Verizon employees, including the members. 
And they were very supportive of that and gave us the green light to do that. And that's an example of, you know, we just think it's important to treat all our employees the same way. Uh, we didn't have to do that, but I think that's an important thing. And the other thing in that construct is the research would say, like in, in the injury space, if there's a, somebody injured on the job, workers comp, or even injured outside of work um, and resulting in a short-term disability, the faster you can connect that employee back with the company, the probability of their returning to work uh, permanently um, is exponential. And the longer there's a gap, the longer there's a delay in connecting, the chances of getting somebody back to full-time employment goes down dramatically. So we thought it was really important through coronavirus to find ways to keep everybody connected to Verizon. So yes, you are a retail store employee, the store is closed, but you know what? You're still on the V team, you're part of the family. We have this immense call to action to support society right now. We're going to send stuff home to your house and you could do telesales because we want you on the team. We want you connected. And we recognize, and I, we talked a lot to our leaders about, you know, for some employees, they're going to thrive and the productivity is going to be the same. And for other employees, this is going to be like making somebody right-handed, right, left-handed. It's a job they don't know how to do. They didn't sign up to do. We're giving them some training and maybe you're not going to get optimal productivity, but anything is better than zero. And the upside of people feeling psychologically connected and part of the organization during the crisis, we felt was really important because I think some of what's getting written about now, um, now that we're in this prolonged phase of coronavirus is the emotional toll. Mm -hmm. And at the very early set of the crisis, we, we kind of took a mindset that said, you know, we're like, obviously, you know, pretend we are like in an emergency care support situation and employees are scared. They're scared of contracting coronavirus. Maybe they're scared of a family member contracting coronavirus or a dear friend or losing a family member that's in an elder care facility that they can't visit. So that's already, and, and there's a lot unknown about the disease. There's more known now, but still a lot that's unknown. And back in March, there was next to nothing known. They're scared of losing their job. They're scared of their financial stability. They're scared of being able to pay rent they've got, probably got friends around them. Unemployment was 30%. So we just took a mindset that said, you know, we're going to be transparent. We're going to do a lot of communication. And so one of the other innovative things we did is starting around uh, that Thursday in March, the, around the 12th, we started a daily broadcast at noon with the CEO uh, and myself. And every day from 12 to 1230, we had an up to speed broadcast. And it's also broadcast out on social media. So employees didn't have to be behind the firewall to watch the update because we wanted to be able to reach people wherever they were. And so pe people in public can watch too. I don't know if, you know, knowing what's going on in our company every day is something that people want to invest time in. But we thought with all of the confusion, having our employees have a safe, you know, a safe place to go every day to see their leaders, what's going on, writing in live questions, and we created a web page, the COVID web page. So it was like, no matter what, go to the COVID web page. It'll always have the current update. It'll have facts, company policy. We put on an Ask Christie box. I put a team of people helping me get answers to all employees within 24 hours. So we really tried to cover all of our bases for keeping people connected to work, keeping people connected to the company, keeping them uh, connected to real information and a source to get their questions answered. And I think that helped people make all these pivots and come up with these innovations. They could see a video on the up to speed at noon of a coworker um, doing a home garaging and out doing a, a service call with their mask on, not going on premise to the customer, but doing it remotely. And so these are all things that we feel uh, helped us and are continuing to help us through the crisis. What I find most impressive is that uh... Verizon decided to redeploy 8,000 retail team members uh, instead of laying them off. All right. So it, it talk about what led to this decision and did it make sense financially? And what were some of the challenges you had to overcome? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, first, we believed that we would be bringing all the stores back on. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we had our very uh, important and valuable team members with us through the crisis. And when we were able to reopen the stores for both safety and shelter in place guideline provisions, they would be ready and fully um, with us. So that was one. I think second from a 
uh, what led us to the decision was we did feel there were meaningful ways to stay connected with our customers, even if it wasn't physically in the store. Um, because the stores weren't open and because people were instructed by the government to not leave their home unless it was uh, critical. Uh, but at the same time, schools were going remote and work was going remote. We were flooded with customer calls or the need for people to be able to purchase online or purchase through a telephone conversation. And so actually our retail employees were able to continue engaging with the customers as if they had been in the stores. So, um, you know, for us, it was a pretty, we didn't spend a lot of time debating the, the math of, of, of does that make sense for us because uh, we felt like it was um, an important way to stay connected with our customers and we believed it was a temporary, not a permanent shift. And what was really interesting is we had been, uh, you know, on a path, I think like most companies to um, provide more access for our customers to do things digitally through Verizon apps uh, to help them with services or new products and development, get their questions answered through chats. And then at the same time, really make that in-person experience something that's, um, you know, very memorable. You know, our, our head of consumer talks about exquisite customer service. We're really going after a a high NPS net promoter score. And so it felt very fitting with our strategy um, to have those employees best trained to support our customers continuing to do so, even if it was through a telephone uh, or a digital engagement. And we actually saw a really big pivot to digital. And we're curious, to be honest, how much of that will be a permanent shift of customer preference and consumer preference, or how much of that is just because of the requirements of coronavirus. And so no, 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 as, we as we began to bring the stores back online, we actually had the employees vote, like fill out an election form um, and they could put the preference of returning to the store in a retail um, sale, you know, sales uh, team member capacity or continuing in a customer service capacity or a customer care or telesales capacity. So the employees all got to elect what they would do uh, next, uh, recognizing that everybody has a whole unique set of circumstances because of COVID and we wanted to give them an opportunity to factor that in. And, and then we did a whole matching and kind of a reload as we brought all the stores back online in the July to September timeframe. And while we couldn't get everybody their first preference, we have um, you know, a lot of people that elected to stay in the remote setting. A lot of people said, no, 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 I can't wait to get back in and be physically on premise. But that was important too. Um, so it's been, it's been an exciting journey. This is a great uh, segue into my next question. Um, so we we know that COVID's accelerated uh, digital transformation. It's accelerated uh, the future of work, the way in which companies were envisioning it. So, uh, what do you think are the lasting changes, and what do you think is gonna, you know, return back to uh, the, the status quo from the past. This is such an exciting time to now be thinking about what are the long-term impacts because we've had so many learnings, whether it's here at Verizon and I'm in so many groups connecting with other companies and we're kind of sharing our learnings as fast as we can. So I think as we have anticipated for some number of years, um, an accelerating future of work, um, old habits die hard, and I would say companies, even our own, were still very, very heavily reliant on physical co-presence, on meetings in person, and while we have obviously exhaustive network connectivity and video meeting capability, we still relied on that in-person experience. So this has really, I think, leapfrogged ourselves as well as many in the world to a different reality. Um, and really allowed us to challenge orthodoxies like you can do online learning. You know, the whole education industry, I think, will be upended by this, which is, I think, exciting for access and equality and shifting outcomes of, of education. And it doesn't mean you eliminate on-premise and in-person, but it means, like, use the right experience for the highest efficacy. And I think the same will flow through into the employment environment. Um, I don't think we'll see a return to everybody has to come into the office so we could count noses and make sure they worked every minute that they're on the payroll. Um, but instead it will be, hey, this kind of work 
can best be done remote, or this has to be done in a direct engagement with the customer, or here's a way that we feel we're serving our customers better with digital. So I think there's a lot that's here to stay. I would say we'll keep, we're going to keep our physical presence. We will continue to have our retail locations. Um, and then the experiences we offer customers in them will continue to evolve. And we want to also listen to them. What are the things they liked being able to do and help themselves with remotely? Recognizing we have a, a wide array of customers. So I think the customer space and how we support that will be very interesting. On the, on the employee side as well, we have, you know, we, we will likely um, entertain uh, a lot more. Well, when this all started, we had 4,500 approximately home-based agents. And we were exploring how scalable that was. We knew we had great employee satisfaction, lower turnover. Um, we made the decision in July. It was working so well that for a large part of our um, consumer facing customer service is now permanently home based. So we have 20 some odd thousand home based agents now. And that begins to unlock a whole nother set of options like, well, great, then where do I recruit people from? How do I onboard them? How do I bring the essence of the company and the values and the culture to life in that kind of setting? So we're tackling that. And I think for jobs that are on premise, there'll be a lot more flexibility, I think, in schedules. And like, what is the, uh, what is the premise for? Right. So it may not just be, well, I'm coming in to be counted and seen doing work. It's probably going to be a premium. Like, what's the premium on when we can get together in person? And it's going to be for collaborating and innovating or cross-functional teamwork, but probably send the material in advance, read it. Let's get together for the discussion and not presenting at each other or doing things that we could do individually. So I get excited too about how we'll think about the premium of, of being together. And so we believe that we will still have physical space and that the physical space is key to who, who we are as a company, but we'll have a lot more remote, a lot more digital and a lot more hybrid. And we're actively involving our employees in those discussions. And we know there's things that the employees really like about the current situation and the degrees of flexibility um, that, that's been introduced. And so we're embarking on a project to figure out post COVID, what of all of the things we've learned stays and we don't just like snap back to how it was before. So Verizon recently announced its Citizen Verizon plan, which includes a pledge to prepare half a million people from vulnerable and under-resourced communities for jobs of the future by 2030 through skills training and job advancement tools. It's indeed a, a great initiative and can potentially change many lives. Uh, Christy, could you give us a more detailed overview of that program? Yeah, that's uh, thanks for calling that out. We're so excited about Citizen Verizon. And I think one of the things that was really compelling when I first engaged and talked with Hans and made the decision to join Verizon was the focus on multiple stakeholders and that we um, care for all four and that we do so in balance and that that, that that will allow us to thrive and our stakeholders to thrive. And we felt, uh, we, we define our stakeholders as our customers, our shareholders, uh, our employees and society. And that Verizon has to serve all four of those stakeholders, do so in balance and then we'll thrive and the stakeholders uh, will thrive. So in that vein, we've done work over the last two years to really define the societal component of our stakeholder commitment. And we really followed the UN um, call to action and the SDGs and the sustainability platform. And we have um, efforts focused against, and, and their framework is sort of uh, uh, profit planet people. And so in that first business focus space, we're really focusing on digitization and helping um, close the digital divide in the world. And then on the planet side, we're really helping with zero, you know, net zero and a lot of the efforts around climate. And in the human prosperity people column, we decided to really put our efforts and focus around um, skilling and making sure people could participate in the new economy. And so we announced in this vein, a partnership, uh, we're going to commit um, in the Citizen Verizon to prepare 500,000 people by 2030 for jobs in this digital economy. And we're going to do so by making investments in reskilling and, and or, or skilling for the first time, not just reskilling. 
And so we've got a $44 million commitment with a nonprofit called Generation. And this multi-year partnership will be definitely aimed at um, skilling American workers to close the digital divide. And this will be focused on workers who are unemployed or underemployed or maybe facing job elimination due to automation or um, you know, other advancements in technology. And now we have been working on that prior to pandemic and now further uh, exacerbated potentially by the pandemic disrupting jobs. And so the curriculum will have both um, technical and professional training. It will focus on aiding the most vulnerable populations uh, again, those facing the systemic challenges. And we also will have focus on the Black and Latinx communities and applicants and also women uh, because we know that the jobs most at risk for replacement by automation or elimination due to the recession from COVID uh, or being replaced as the digitization and tech innovations take off are um, have a larger incumbent base of women and people of color. And so that's at a high level what we've just announced uh, within the last month. And I'm really excited to have that partner with the societal commitment to that, to also the commitment we have to our own employees. And we have a massive uh, investment every year in skilling and keeping our employee base current. So so when when it comes to uh, deploying these folks into the workforce, how are you thinking about that aspect? Well, I think if I think you know this is an area where if we help um, skill employees in the U.S. workforce, um, that will hopefully ready uh, the talent pool in the United States for jobs. And I think that that will help companies uh, believe that there's the workforce available to have those jobs here mm -hmm. um, to service the uh, markets and the economy in the country. And then maybe that could be replicated in other countries that. Uh, that we operate in. And so I think that's the idea that we would contribute to society overall by helping provide access to education and access to relevant skills that we can help, you know, inform a generation and inform some of the other partnerships we're working with on what our skills employers need. Mm -hmm. And there's no obligation that somehow those skills can be provided only to people that are interested in working at Verizon um, it's really truly for society, for people to get skills they need to find gainful employment. And then for our own employees, we're doing uh, a lot of commitment to their skilling and reskilling because, you know, it's so interesting. Um, but the, the idea that we'll finish school at 18 uh, at the high school level or in our 20s with some post 12th grade education and then know everything we need to know for the rest of our work life. Like that's a that's a framework from the past that just will not work. And I think one of the things that, you know, I've been working on for, you know, a number of years, probably close to a decade since, uh, since I really started working on this in earnest, it's really creating the concept of lifelong learners and having employees think about that in terms of how they think about their career. And when I think about like my parents' generation worked 30 years, like that was a career. That was the arc of a career. You were going to work 30 years. You'd probably work at one employer and then you'd retire. And that would be like a, a life well-led uh, mortgages were for 30 years. Like it all kind of tied together. I will, I've already worked 32 years here in the next year. And I am probably going to work at least 40 and I have children that are 13 to 21. And I tell them, and when I talk on campuses, I say, you know, you're, you, spoiler alert, everybody's going to live longer, but you might work 50 years. Like you might have, and no one's really doing, no one's architecting. What does a career look like if it's 40 years? What does a career look like when it's 50 years? And it's not going to be this vertical shoot of the careers of the seventies and eighties. It's going to be broad. It's going to be skill focused. People may have multiple chapters of their career that take them into different industries or dabbling. Maybe I'm a leader here. Maybe I'm an individual expert here. So I feel like there's a lot of space still to be covered in that ground. And so I think by putting our effort on reskilling, getting workers in the economy, even adult workers, that maybe they're in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, thinking, hey, I'm going to go learn a new skill. Maybe I'm going to learn how to code. Just go online to Code Academy. 
is not just for 17 year olds or 15 year olds or 10 year olds in school. So I, I really do hope that we can slay that paradigm because I think it's holding back so many of our competent workers that need to evolve their skills to contribute and also find meaning and feel valued, right? We know all the research now continues to show people finding purpose in their work, connecting with the purpose of the organizations that they serve or work in um, is really important for meaning in life. And as we deal with what will be all of the emotional and mental strain caused by coronavirus or the economic stress um, and, and, and the damage that that's causing, helping people have skills so that they feel they matter, that they feel relevant, they can support themselves, they can have human dignity. I think there's a lot connected here. And I think um, skilling and, and having people be comfortable with being a lifelong learner um, could be a big part of that. So I'm excited about that. In, in relation to uh, skilling and reskilling, Verizon spent uh, 216 million last year uh, in, in learning development programs. So could, could you talk about the programs, the outcomes, and how managers are developing their employees uh, with the development plans? Super. We have a learning portal um, and we, we promote it heavily to all of our employees. And then we have curriculum inside of the learning portal, some of which we create ourselves inside Verizon, and then some of which are curriculum with partners that we have available to all of our employees. And we have uh, you know, a, a variety of leadership programs so people can learn how to manage themselves, lead teams, lead large organizations. And I think in the skilling space, you know, we have everything from teaching an employee how to do a job, like be a customer support and solution specialist to one of our retail team members to maybe being a tech in the field and how to do fiber splicing and how to install fiber and cable. So we do everything from trades all the way to job uh, skilling. And there's a, there's a lot of that because our jobs have a lot of um, component, you know, skills there. So that's one. Um, I think second, we have just available to people a library of here's skills you might want to acquire. We also have a huge tuition reimbursement program. So like at any time we have on the order of 20 plus thousand employees taking classes at uh, accredited um, community uh, college and, and post uh, high school baccalaureate programs, trades programs, um, gaining skills that are uh, relevant to the job. And we've also uh, added, due to coronavirus, a fair amount of training now, and we'll, we're going to continue to build it out around remote working, managing distributed teams, because a lot of management training was like member management by walking around and go get the input from your employees and get that two-way feedback. But underlying all of that was do so in person, do so physically. Um, and so we're building out real time, you know, those kind of skills our employees are asking for it, our managers are asking for, how do I lead in this environment? This is all foreign to me. How do I know work is getting done? How do I help, you know, continue to invest in the growth of my team members? And so our skills uh, and training curriculum go across that we have literally, we probably deliver uh, over 300,000 plus hours a year of training to our employees and employees of our ecosystem partners. So if we have partners that uh, sell or service Verizon accounts, uh, we provide material to their teams to train their own organization. So it's it's really a, one of the largest areas we have in our human resource function. So on, on top of um, all the, these initiatives that you're working on, Verizon has also taken a pretty active role in uh, uh, driving racial justice, equality, both within and beyond its walls. Can, can you talk about these initiatives and, and why you think they are important? Well, I think, um, you know, just like the coronavirus presented us with an unexpected surprise, um, the murder of George Floyd and then the following um, societal support for an outpouring for and demand for change um, in social justice was, you know, really overwhelming. And we have a longstanding, you know, 20 plus year, we've been alive 20 years as Verizon commitment to diversity and inclusion and being a leader in this space. I've been working on DNI for my 32 year career. 
uh, and the ac the actions and the outpouring uh, was like nothing I've ever experienced in my life. So that uh, on its own was was pretty overwhelming. And I think Verizon has had a big voice in this space, but we really felt it was important to do a couple of things. So we started with what we called courageous conversations. Uh, our CEO, a number of our board members, and a number of our leaders and myself um, had broadcasts and talked openly about the issues and that we weren't really going to make progress as a society um, and move forward uh, in terms of racial equality and, and eliminating racism unless we were willing to talk about it openly. I mean, step one of any self-improvement program is admit there's a problem, right? And so if you don't admit there's a problem, we're probably not going to fix the problem. So we felt it was really important to say there is a problem. We don't pretend to have all the answers or all the solutions, but we want to stand humbly before our employees and the customer set and society and say, we believe there is a problem as many have called out and we believe we should all work together on a solution. So we're going to do a lot of listening. We're going to double down on things we know have worked and we're probably going to introduce some new things that we haven't tried before that you're going to suggest to us so that we could be part of making new strides. And then the three main tenants of our actions have focused against continuing those courageous conversations, creating safe space for those conversations. We've hosted inside the company, you know, literally hundreds with tens of thousands of employees participating in virtual calls just to talk about what was happening, to share information, have a conversation about race that may be uncomfortable, but do it in a way that people could learn. On the heels of that, we actually got a lot of employee requests saying, I don't actually know that much about the history of this. And I'm embarrassed to say I don't. I'm embarrassed to ask. I'm so embarrassed. I might not even feel comfortable talking to my coworkers about it. And so can you help me? So we actually pivoted and put together uh, a, a little curriculum on our learning portal that all employees can access to give them a history of race relations in the United States and in other parts of the world and just some some information to help ground them if they felt they didn't know that. And to me, that was so important because any first admitting there's a problem is critical to moving forward. And then second, educating people about the problem um, so that they can also then figure out how to take that knowledge, integrate it with their firsthand personal experience to, to find ways to engage on a solution. Another thing we did, um, so in the continuing conversation, another thing we did is we made a, a, a donation of $10 million to seven of the leading organizations on racial justice and social justice, such as the NAACP, the Rainbow Coalition, and more. And our head of um, social responsibility has been meeting with the leaders of those organizations to understand how that money will be utilized We've been curating related to that volunteer opportunities for the Verizon employees to volunteer against those priorities with these organizations. And we're doing that through our volunteer portal and our 2.5 million volunteer hour commitment. These are paid hours that we pay our employees to volunteer. And in addition, we actually had our CEO uh, meet with the heads of each of those organizations just to listen and learn what were they focused on and what did they need leaders uh, of corporate America to be doing to help uh, advance criminal and social justice reform, racial relations reform. And so that has also led us to have a pretty active role in the business roundtable and the work they're doing on criminal justice reform and equality. And then finally, inside the company, the third tenant to me is we're creating courageous conversations, we're participating in helping being a leader in society, but we also need to be the organization we wanna see in the world. <laughs> So we're taking a hard look in the mirror uh, openly with our employees and doubling down on the things we think we've been successful at and then identifying areas that we haven't made the progress we would like and thinking about openly with our teams, what would we do to have breakthroughs? One of the things early on, our employees, we already had a plan to release a human capital report in the uh, 2021 with the proxy season. We pulled forward releasing all of our diversity data because it was so important to us and our employees that they knew we were comfortable being transparent about that. And so we've released on our webpage our, um, our diversity and inclusion, we're calling our diversity representation report 
and you can look at Verizon overall, our four main operating units and the corporate staff functions. And we're showing you all the levels that we have and what the percent women are and then what the percent people of color are by race. And we use that to have discussions with our teams, with our employee resource groups, and a little bit like the outset of, we're gonna have to figure out how to get everybody to work from home and we don't know how to do that. And our employees helped us. Here, similarly, we have a lot of things we've done really well. There's a lot of places where our diversity results are outstanding and above all, many norms and standards. And then there's areas where we could be better and now we're able with those facts to talk to our teams or have them come talk to us and say, I see, you know, I think we, I could help here or, Hey, what do I do to get X, Y, Z? And so that's a, and so we're on the journey and I want Verizon and, and, and our HR team and our, our V teamers to feel like we're leading in this space and being humble about what we can learn from other people. This is very impressive, and uh, what a progressive uh, organization Horizon is. Uh, uh, you know, I wish every organization would emulate uh, this kind of uh, initiative. Yeah. Thank you for that. And you know, I talked. A lot of companies are afraid to do it. And the comptroller of New York sent a letter to most of the Fortune 500, suggesting that they should all release their EEO one report. And of course, we complied with that. But if I shared my EEO one report with my employees, it wouldn't mean anything to them because there's, and for the right reasons, the government has categories, there's codes for every type of work. It ties to the census, it ties to labor statistics, it ties to availability tracking that they do. And so we could have done that and just checked the box and our employees wouldn't really know what it meant and it wouldn't serve as a tool. And so we felt like, let's go farther. Let's meet the minimum requirement, but let's go farther. And now we can have a real conversation that says, you know what? We have great representation in our entry levels and actually at the VP and above level and in the middle, there's a gap, like what's happening at the first line and second level leadership levels. Uh, and and we, we have a drop off of women. We have a drop off of African-American and Latin uh, ex employees. So now we can go talk to those teams and say, what's going on here? Or offer more leadership programs, offer more, change our, you know, do more campus pipelining and things like this. So, um, and and to be honest, if I, you know, this is a, a little bit of some of the challenge with this space is give people all the facts to have a fulsome conversation. So I also talk to, and I've received some letters from employees that say, do you still care about me? I'm a white male with 20 years of service at Verizon. And I say, of course we care about you. We care about all Verizon employees, all prospective talent. We care about having a thriving labor market. And there's, you know, we want all employees to experience the company the same. And we have a, a huge and a strong and a vibrant cohort of white males in the company too. And so we're really trying to make sure that we drive a conversation of inclusion and collective and a we, and really not um, have a divisive nature to the dialogue. And so that's where I think the creating the safe space, putting the training out there so people can learn in private if there's something they feel they don't know, um, and then um, engaging our employees in what would good look like to us and how can we get there together. This has uh, been great, Christy. Thank you so much for your time. We're very inspirational, actually. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful to share our story, and I'm so uh, grateful to be included and I'm, I'm looking forward to learning from the other uh, leaders and experts and thought uh, thought leaders you have on on the show so I'm sure that I'll continue to benefit from that so thank you so much <laughs>